we're going to have a two-part presentation today. Um, my colleague Lewis will, will uh, start us off with giving a uh, talk about uh, the Hug and Face Hub, all the things you can find on there, models, data sets, and demos. And then I will uh, pick up from there uh, with how you can actually build your own demos using the Gradio library. It'll be a hands-on demo, so we'll, we'll actually jump into some code and, and play with it. Um, so we'll do some uh, introductions here. Um, uh, my name is Nate. Uh, I am a self-proclaimed machine learning hacker. Um, I got my start in data science working at, a, uh, at PwC uh, as a data scientist, where I built uh, interpretable financial anomaly detection algorithms for Fortune 500 companies. Um, and then I got into open source, where I worked uh, as a research engineer for uh, PyTorch Lightning, which is a tool that helps you scale up your, your PyTorch uh, training. Um, and now I work here at Hug and Face, uh, trying to uh, democratize uh, machine learning. Uh, Lewis? Yeah, great. Thanks for having us as well, Matt. And uh, yeah, my name is Lewis, and I'm also a machine learning engineer at Hugging Face. I'm a little bit like Nate in the sense that I'm a, a fake engineer. Um, I'm originally a physicist, and I, I did lots of nerdy things um, around the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, and that was how I kind of discovered machine learning um, through analyzing the kind of petabytes of data that um, these experiments produce. And I kind of realized that, you know, my future as a physicist was in jeopardy um, from deep learning and that there were some, you know, really interesting problems to, to solve in the real world, so to speak. So I switched uh, fields and I've um, been working in uh, machine learning for the last five years or so. And at Hugging Face, I'm the kind of co-lead of the Hugging Face course, um, which is a free course we offer for people who want to learn about transformers and NLP. And I'm also the co-author of a recent book by Riley called NLP with Transformers. So if you have any questions about transformers today, feel free to put them in the chat. And um, as Nate was also saying, um, if you have any questions about anything we're talking about, just, uh, just put them in the chat and then we'll kind of you know, interrupt each other as we go. So to get started, oops, let me see. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, I thought it'd be nice to give a kind of tour um, through the Hugging Face Hub. So if this is the first time you're hearing about what, what is Hugging Face, is it just an emoji, is it a company, you know, so on and so forth. Um, the goal here is to kind of give you a, a high level picture of, of, of what we do at Hugging Face and in particular, the kind of um, challenges that we're trying to solve in the space of machine learning and how to make it um, more accessible um, to the broader community. So to get started, let's like think about a kind of particular application or use case. So a, a really common task in NLP um, is to think about how can we summarize long documents into kind of like management summaries. So a very classic thing would be to take, for example, news articles and see if you can find a way to sort of train a model that can then condense a news report into something that, you know, gives you a quick idea of what's going on. And so in this particular example, we might have an article about a certain uh, CEO and, you know, he might be tweeting a lot and, you know, rigging the stock market. And we might want to be able to sort of track that kind of in real time, because, you know, if our business is going to be impacted, we would like to be able to, you know, not have to read tons of news articles to, to act on that. So this particular task is called um, text summarization, where we take a long text and we condense it into a short summary. And the kind of first thing that we would need to do is really figure out, okay, what type of data should we start with? So um, what we could do is we could maybe scrape some news uh, websites, um, or we may have some in-house articles that we would have collected, um, you know, over time from some sources or our customers. And then we would need to kind of process and kind of prepare this data set um, ready for, you know, training an algorithm or a machine learning model on top of that. So we've got a data set and then you'd say, okay, great. Now I'm going to uh, train a model and, you know, the whole kind of process of machine learning is quite iterative. So typically, you know, you, you train a model, you evaluate it, um, preferably on a test set that, you know, doesn't, you know, bias the model and or the model hasn't seen. And then you would kind of say, oh, you know, maybe this isn't so great. Let's, you know, iterate again, tweak some hyperparameters. And eventually you'll reach some kind of, let's say, happy, happy path where you, you've got a model that you think is doing quite well. But this whole process is typically, you know, kind of time consuming um, because every time you iterate, you might need to write a bit of different code, you know, tweak these parameters and keeping track of like, you know, the process is, is often a bit error prone and 
you know, if you've ever done lots and lots of experiments, you may have, you know, shared Excel files with your colleagues, or maybe you say, hey, I've got a great model. Here's like, you know, the pickled file and I'm going to put it in an email. And, you know, this is like kind of like, let's say the, the traditional way that, you know, a lot of people, you know, share um, the, the sort of results of their experiments, but also, you know, the intermediate uh, models that they're training. So this is kind of a time consuming process typically. And the kind of question that we're trying to um, ask at Hugging Face is like, is there a better way of um, not just training models, but sharing them um, and sharing the artifacts that come in a machine learning um, workflow? So this isn't just necessarily a model. It may be, for example, a process data set. It may also be, as I mentioned before, some experimental results. And the kind of key thing here is to sort of try to avoid reinventing the wheel. So um, anyone who is kind of familiar with the like ecosystem around ML tooling knows that there's like tons of you know different startups uh, trying to like build like you know experiment tracking um, or trying to kind of find a way to like make this whole process um, a bit smoother. And the kind of approach that we take at Hugging Face is to really kind of prioritize um, a focus on open source tooling. So we try not to, you know, um, integrate too many things that are like closed source because we feel that open source is really like the, the future of how we should um, develop uh, tools. And the other thing that we sort of strongly believe in is this kind of collaborate first culture. So the idea is that like most people in machine learning hopefully aren't just training models in isolation. You typically have some colleagues, whether they're research colleagues or whether they're just, you know, your, your colleagues at work. And we want to kind of um, build the tools that enable you to collaborate um, in the easiest way possible. So the way that we um, kind of think that we can solve this problem or answer this question um, is by having a kind of central platform, which we call the Hugging Face Hub. And this hub essentially collects um, models, data sets, and as Nate will show you shortly, what we call spaces, um, which are essentially um, tools that allow you to basically create um, machine learning applications in, in a really, relatively simple way. And the idea is that these kind of three components are, are sort of like the central pieces um, involved in taking an idea all the way through to being able to kind of demo it and ultimately deploy it um, in a kind of um, production setting. And there are other aspects around the hub that we won't get into today. But for example, we have um, elements around, for example, doing inference in optimized ways. Um, and if you have questions about that, we can you know, take that in, in the question and answering section. Okay, so um, most people, just sort of to get this out of the, out of the, the way, most people think of Hugging Face to do with NLP. Um, and a lot of that is because transformers um, originated from NLP. So the very famous paper, Attention is All You Need, was about machine translation. And then this kind of exploded with things like BERT and GPT-2 to cover, you know, more or less all of the kind of core tasks in NLP. And since Hugging Face is built on top of the Transformers library, this is usually the first domain um, that people think of. But what we found is that um, this kind of general pattern of how do you easily share models, data sets, and demos is kind of like a universal feature of machine learning. And in the last year or so, we've been expanding into new domains such as uh, speech, uh, vision, and more recently, reinforcement learning. And if there's a particular domain that you're really passionate about, for example, maybe it's um, an aspect of the natural sciences, or maybe it's something like, you know, doing ML for art or so on, um, you know, please reach out to us because we're really, you know, interested in making the, the tools as accessible as possible. Um, so probably by the time that, you know, we do this talk again, this slide will have more domains on it, but these are kind of the core ones that we currently focus on right now. So as I mentioned before, Transformers is like the open source library that um, Hugging Face is kind of built on. Um, but since then, we've kind of expanded um, into other aspects of the machine learning um, pipeline. And so if you do NLP, you know that a really important part is how do you tokenize your text? So how do you basically convert raw text or strings into the numerical uh, inputs for, for the neural networks? So we have a tokenizers library. Um, we also have a data sets library, which we use uh, for basically sharing and um, processing data. And we won't go into all of these different components, but just to give you a sense that there are like a broader set of tools um, that um, may be interesting uh, for what you're doing in your, in your work. So the kind of first thing that I want to um, show is like, you know, what does it mean to have a hub? And in particular, what does it mean to have a hub of models? So here's a screenshot of basically um, what it looks like if you go to hf.co. 
And I think, you know, screenshots are great, but maybe let's uh, do some live demoing of, of what, what we're talking about. So if you go to hf.co, <clears throat> um, if you have a profile, you'll see this kind of um, activity page. Um, but if, you're, if, you, if you haven't got an account, you can just sign up and then you'll see something like this. And if I click on the models page or the models tab, um, what you can see is that we've got something like, you know, 30,000 um, different models in the hub. And these models really span um, a wide range of different tasks. So as I mentioned before, um, it's not just NLP uh, these days. We're now covering um, aspects to do with audio. Um, we've got elements of computer vision. And as I mentioned before, more, re more recently with reinforcement learning. So maybe um, is there someone here who has a particular task they would be interested in, um, they would like us to like maybe, you know, play around with maybe Matt or um, someone else. Is there something that you would like us to, to play with? Somebody speak up or I'll have to say translation. Okay, great. So translation is um, kind of like a generative task. So this is in the domain of, let's say, maybe text-to-text -text generation. Um, and here we've got a, a range of uh, different models. So this covers everything from uh, summarization um, to um, also translation. And there's um, a very famous set of models, which are these opus, um, oh, maybe it's in the text generation tab, sorry. There are these opus models. Wait, let's go over here. Other in translation. There we go. Great. Ah, is there a translation task? Yeah, yeah. But that's fine. Okay, great. So let me just see. This is what happens when you do live demos, you make mistakes. But anyway, we're going to go with this. There we go. There's a translation task. Wow. <laughs> okay, good. So as I was saying, we have these. Um, there's a, an organization called Helsinki NLP, and they have like literally hundreds of translation models, um, basically spanning like you know different pairs, for example, English to German and so on. So if we pick on, click on this model, then what you'll see um, is typically what's called a model card. And the model card, um, what we, we basically ask model owners to provide is some like key information about how the model was trained, um, maybe some information about um, the kind of benchmarks, and we'll see um, in, a, in a second when we look at, for example, GPT-2, that um, we also provide lots more information to do with like the sort of social impact these models may have. But in any case, um, one thing that you have on the hub is you basically have a widget associated with each of these tasks. And this makes it um, relatively easy for you to just interact with the model uh, on the fly. So here we've got, my name is Sarah and I live in London. And this particular model, hopefully will translate it into German. So if I hit compute, um, we'll see, yeah, my name is Sarah and ich liebe, ich liebe in London. So that looks like a pretty good um, German translation. And you could do this in principle, you know, for any of these other different language pairs. And it gives you a sense of like what the model is capable of. And if you happen to be a native speaker, you can also then, you know, try more complicated um, examples to see kind of qualitatively how good the translation is. So this is just an example of a model that's hosted on the hub. Um, now, if I go back to my slides, um, just as sort of summary of what we, what we have, um, we've got over these 30,000 different models. There are these, at the moment, over 20 different tasks. And the kind of interesting aspect here from an NLP perspective is that because all, many of these models are contributed by the community, um, we actually span a large range of different languages. And if you're working in NLP, you know that like one of the kind of common problems that we face as a community is that almost everything is English centric. Um, and, you know, many of the sort of best performing models tend to unfortunately be in English because that's where we have most of the sort of, um, you know, say text data and resources. Um, but many of our community members have actually contributed really great pre-trained models, um, for example, in Spanish and in German. Um, using the, the sort of tools in the ecosystem and then contributing back to the community so that then other people in those communities can ultimately use it for their applications. And I personally find this to be like an extremely exciting part of how a hub can enable kind of a global community to kind of build on top of each other's work. So um, let's maybe look at a couple of other features that are associated with um, the hub. We've just seen um, an example of the model card. 
So if we go to, for example, GPT-2, this is one that is like a very famous model that hopefully doesn't need any introduction. Um, it's the one from OpenAI that kind of, at least for me, um, made me really pay attention to transformers. And for example, here I can generate text um, using this model. And in this model card, we've got now much more information in particular about the intended uses and limitations. And this is something that, again, we encourage our community to really work hard on because many of these models are typically biased by the type of data that they're trained on. So in the case of GPT-2, um, I believe it was trained on Reddit um, threads and there was some curation involved, but you know, Reddit has some nasty areas in it and that those nasty areas will then be kind of manifest in the models. So if we ask you know, a certain prompt, it will typically generate something that's potentially racist or sexist. So including information about the sort of uses um, of this model is, is important. And then we also you know, ask people to talk about different aspects of bias. And so you can see here, for example, um, this is a, a classic case where if you prompt GPT-2 with something like, you know, the white man worked as a whatever, then it will provide kind of occupations that are kind of stereotypically associated with men. So things like bus conductor, plumber, journalist. And that kind of like reinforces the sort of standard problems we have with language, which is that, you know, things like CEO are typically associated with men. And, you know, it kind of precludes the fact that half the population, you know, is, is excluded from that conversation. And then there's other sort of aspects that, you know, you can look for yourself um, to do with like the training data and so on. So that's like a sort of um, deep dive into the model cards. The other thing that's like um, interesting, I was mentioning before that in this process of training models, um, having a way to kind of keep track of like how your experiments are going is usually a, a, an important um, process. And here I've got basically um, a, a sort of checkpoint from this big science um, collaboration, which is an attempt to basically train a very large language model of the scale of GPT-3. And if you look at the model um, page, you'll see something called training metrics. And here we've basically integrated um, the TensorBoard um, tool from Google um, into the hub. And this will then show you, for example, how things like the loss are progressing, how the batch size is increasing and so on. And this, if you're using the Transformers library, all of this will be automatically uh, created for you when you um, basically train. And then when you push to the hub, um, you'll be able to sort of see, um, you know, how your model is progressing in kind of real time. And so this is this aspect about using open source tools instead of trying to reinvent, you know, our own kind of experiment tracking tool. Just a few more things to, um, to maybe showcase here. Um, one of the um, sort of other important um, kind of considerations that is, is very topical at the moment is, is it all about sort of like, what is the environmental impact of training large models? Um, and although places like Google and Microsoft kind of offset their emissions by using renewable energy, um, that, you know, isn't necessarily the case for most of us who are, you know, using, you know, AWS or GCP or something. And so if you're interested in tracking um, the kind of impact of your models, we also, um, you can include essentially the carbon emissions. Again, part of the Transformers library, this will be um, logged um, during your training runs. And then just one last thing that is um, uh, maybe interesting to mention, uh, again, in the direction of evaluation, is that um, we store um, during training all of the metrics um, basically as metadata that you can then see uh, visualized um, on the hub. So here is a particular model, a speech model that was trained or fine-tuned on Indonesian uh, uh, speech files, audio files. And here you can see the kind of reporting of the word error rate and so on. And this allows you to ultimately then compare different models and see you know, how well they're doing um, on kind of very public data sets. Um, cool, so one last thing I wanted to mention is that the sort of machinery behind everything on the hub is basically Git. Um, so if you've never heard of Git, it's essentially a way of like versioning files and keeping track of like the history and the evolution of how changes are made to files. And if you click on the files and versions part um, of, of the hub or of a particular model, you'll see that um, you know, all these files are kind of like basically Git tracked files or Git history. And you'll see a little LFS tag associated with some files. 
And that's called Git large file storage. So this is essentially how we manage very large models. Um, you know, anything that's basically over <clears throat> 10 or let's say a few hundred megabytes, um, it's going to be tracked with Git LFS. And this means that you can do versioning using the standard Git tooling, but you can handle, you know, up to terabytes um, of data using this. Okay, so that's like the sort of, let's say, high level of the kind of core features associated with um, models on the Hugging Face Hub. Um, and I kind of emphasized everything I kind of showed you was kind of like a transformers model, again, because that's most of what, um, you know, we've worked on. But um, in the last year or so, Nate and others in the team have been working really hard to like figure out how can we integrate other libraries because you know not everyone in the world is using Transformers. And so, for example, if you're using Keras, there's something called push to hub Keras. It's like a, essentially a function um, that then when you train your model using Keras, you can also push the checkpoint or the save file directly to the hub, and then you can load it in your downstream scripts. So the kind of idea here is what I mentioned earlier that we try to really be like kind of open source like first and really kind of collaborative so that we try to make the, the, the general tools that we've built around transformers available to like, you know, the wider ML community. So I've shown you a little bit about, you know, models and that's kind of like the idea is that you sort of pick a pre-trained model from the hub and then you train it and then you upload it. Um, but I haven't really talked much about data sets, which are like a very important component of, of the Hugging Face Hub um, or in general of, of any machine learning workflow. So in the same way that we have um, models and a model hub, we also have data sets. And again, if I just show you what that looks like, we can see that there's a data sets tab here. And in this data sets tab, we again have a list of different uh, tasks. Um, we have different languages and different sizes. And so for example, if I click on glue, this is a very famous benchmark in NLP, then I'll get some information that is talking about a particular subset um, of this benchmark. I can see some examples and what the labels are. And again, we have this concept of data set cards so that um, data set owners can then provide information about what this data set is about and so on and so forth. And what's also like quite cool is that you can link data sets to models. So here you can see on the right hand side, all the models that have basically been trained on the um, blue benchmark. And this allows you to then ultimately create things like leaderboards and also visualize, you know, um, which models are doing best on a certain task. And this is something that um, I find personally quite useful because, you know, when you're thinking about starting a project, you know, especially if you're doing NLP, most people reach for like BERT because it's like, you know, in your mind, it's the famous one. But since then, there's been a lot of development in, you know, sort of like smaller models that achieve very similar performance, things like Distilled BERT, Mini LM, DeBerta, and so on. And this gives you a way of like kind of, you know, inspecting which models um, do well on certain um, tasks. So, as I mentioned, um, there's like the data sets hub and kind of strongly connected to that is the, the data sets library. And this um, library is a Python library that lets you load any data set from the hub with a load data set function. Um, but the, the really special features about it is that it allows you to load larger than RAM data sets um, using a technique called memory mapping. So this is a, a, a sort of underlying something called Apache Arrow, um, which is a way of basically, um, instead of loading data directly into RAM, you basically have pointers to these files and then you can basically access um, just aspects of, of those individual files. Um, and so this means that, for example, you can um, load in your data set, sorry, in your, in your laptop, um, something like, I don't know, Wikipedia or larger, which might be like, you know, a gigabyte or more, several gigabytes uh, of, of RAM, and you won't blow up your CPU. And the other aspect that this memory mapping provides is you can uh, process data sets in a, in a multi-processing fashion um, really fast. So you can basically crunch through like, you know, 20 terabytes, what, 20 gigabytes of data in about a minute. And we also support things like streaming. So you can basically load data on, on the fly, which allows you to then um, essentially handle situations where you may have larger than disk um, data sets. So if you're trying to do pre-training where you may have like a 20 terabyte corpus, something outrageous like this, then that's a bit too big, but then, you know, you get the point. Um, you can actually process this on the fly. Um, and so you're only ever loading into, into disk 
um, the, the, the examples that you're training on. And so this can also be uh, quite a useful unblocker uh, for, for, for ML. So that's uh, kind of like a, a very high level description of, of the hub and kind of like some of the core libraries. And now I'll uh, switch to, to Nate, who's going to talk to us about, you know, what happens after we've trained a model. So with that, I'll stop sharing and let Nate take over. Beautiful. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, we got a question. Somebody's raising their hand. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, about the data sets um, library, I don't understand. Does it um, fetch the data set from Hugging Face or is it stored locally? Yeah, great question. So the, the data sets library um, lets you download from the hub um, any of the data sets that are stored. So for example, if I take squad, it will actually download into my hard drive, um, essentially, you know, a pointer to this original file. And then it will convert those files into this arrow format, which means that you don't have to load the whole data set into RAM. But you can also Just load... in one line, uh, it fits from up and uh, stores. Stores locally, yeah, that's right. But you can yeah, also load lo local files. So for example, imagine that I have my own data set, which isn't on the hub because maybe it's something private. I don't want to you know, share it or whatever. Then the data sets library also can load these files in the same way. And it will um, also bring you all the kind of features of you know, memory mapping and, and so forth. OK, thank you. Right. Thanks. And just to add uh, yeah, on another point there, um, so in some cases it is downloading from the hub, in some cases it's downloading from the original author's source. So it like, it, it depends on however um, um, the person who wrote the data set loading script uh, uh, went about it. So there's two types of data sets. One is like the ones that are part of the library itself that are built in, and then there's community uh, uploaded uh, data sets as well. So those can either be coming from the hub, downloading from the hub if they chose to store the data there, or if, if um, uh, they're using it from the original author's source, it might be downloading from uh, elsewhere. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Um, already moving on. Um, uh, Lewis, thank you so much. Uh, Lewis covered, uh, you know, kind of uh, two of the three biggest kind of pillars in um, machine learning, and, and that's, you know, um, machine learning models and, and data sets. And now in this part of the presentation, we're going to be talking about demos, which is what you do once you've trained your model. So you've got this shiny new model, and uh, uh, what can we do with it? And that, the answer to that is, is, is demo it. So the goal of this presentation is to first, you know, talk about why machine learning demos are important. And then after that, we're going to talk about um, how to build a demo. And that's going to be both uh, uh, how you may have done it in the past and, and how you can do it with uh, the Gradio library, which is what we're going to be using. And then we're going to get our hands dirty and actually do some live programming uh, with Gradio. And, and hopefully we'll get to uh, using Hug and Face Spaces. So one thing I actually will share with you real quickly is I believe I saved this to my clipboard already. Hopefully, yes, I did. Okay, I've just sent in the chat the the link to join the organization, the great the uh, the organization that we created for you you folks. So if we get to the spaces part, we'll be able to all share a space inside that organization. All right. Um, so why demos? You know why are demos important? Well. You know, when a machine learning model is just stuck as a, um, you know, a large file that's sitting inside a repo, or if it's something that you only can interact with uh, via code, it's not very accessible to a wider audience. So what a demo allows you to do is allows um, your model or, or system to be interfaced with by a wide, diverse group of users. And so, uh, you know, not only does this help uh, prove that your, your results are reproducible, but it also allows a diverse group of users to identify and debug different failure points or biases with your model, which is really important. So it's not just, you know, machine learning engineers that are able to use uh, your demo now. You can now send it to, you know, your grandma and your grandma can use it. So uh, one question I'd like to ask here is, is anybody here ever built or tried to build a demo for a machine learning model? Anybody? Hit me in the chat. I'm getting some nods. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, and so, uh, 
you know, usually the process of when you go to build a demo, this is kind of this, this uh, goes like this, right? Um, you know, I really have this, I have this, this awesome model I trained, and now I want to build a web app. And then you realize, oh, crap, I have to learn, you know, Flask, Docker, JavaScript, CSS, all sorts of, also like a whole suite of tools, Bash, you know, and then you kind of give up. And that's a little disheartening, right? So um, the reason for that is that um, there's a ton of different tools that you have to learn across the, the whole you know, life cycle of building a machine learning app, right? So you probably trained your model or built your model in, in TensorFlow or PyTorch. And then, you know, if you need to containerize your, your, your model, you're going to have to know Bash and Docker. And, you know, to build the app, you probably use Flask. For the back end, and then you'll, you'll use something like HTML, CSS, JavaScript for the front end to create an interactive user interface. You might need something like MySQL to handle the data. And then all of a sudden, you're like, you know, it's been 10 years and now your model is completely outdated. <laughs> you went through this whole process of learning all these, these, these tools. Uh, and so that's, I mean, it's, it takes a long time to learn these things. So um, what Gradio does is it basically takes all those parts that were, um, you know, in all these different languages, it makes them all uh, uh, accessible via Python. So now you can containerize and deploy the model, store uh, data samples, build an interactive uh, front-end interface for your for your demo, all in Python. Uh, right, like which is the language you're used to if you were if you were using if you're a data scientist probably and you're using, um, you know, frameworks like PyTorch and TensorFlow. So now we're going to take a look at a few um, example. Uh, interfaces that were built using the Gradio library. So this one is uh, JoJoGan. It's basically a um, face stylization app. So you upload sort of a picture of yourself. This is uh, my colleague Omar, and this one's going to try to turn you into a Disney character. Uh, so that's that's pretty cool. So you can do things like you know pass in images and get images back. Uh, going back to the new summarization example that Lewis talked about earlier, uh, this is a new summarization app. So you kind of give it a uh, URL to a, um, a news article. It'll you know get the text from it, and it'll try to create a, a summary from it. And then this one is a voice authentication app uh, from Microsoft, uh, where basically you you upload two different audio clips or you record two different audio clips of uh, people speaking, and uh, it'll try to tell you if they're the same same person or if they're different people. Maybe it's for authentication for phones or something, you know. Um, and all, what all these apps have in common is that they were, they were built using the, the Gradio library. And so this is what Gradio looks like. The idea is that it should be as simple as possible. In just a few lines of Python code, you should be able to get up and running and building interfaces for, for whatever it is you'd like to build an interface for. So um, here we see that we import Gradio, and then we use this thing called the Gradio interface class to define uh, what the logic is of your of your um, interface? You know what are you going? What function are you going to be interfacing with? What the inputs to that function are, and what the outputs are going to be coming out of that function? And then you just launch the app. And what's awesome about this is that this could work from uh, you know your local um, uh, Python interpreter. This will work from a Jupyter notebook on your computer, and this can work from Colab uh, notebooks. So anywhere that you you may be using uh, Python, uh, you can build and and use an interface. So what's also great about this is that, you know, uh, you know, if you build a demo, you know, you you'll have a demo and it works on your computer, cool. Or you know, you have a demo and you have some code for it and you can share it with somebody, uh, you know, on GitHub, and then they have to pull your code down and run it, and then they can see the app. Um, but what people really want to be able to do is share their their apps with the community, so then anybody can use use your app. And so that's why. Uh, we at Hugging Face created Hugging Face Spaces, and the idea behind Spaces is we want it to be we want to make it as easy as possible to have folks be able to share machine learning demo apps with uh, the community. So on Spaces, you can basically uh, take some Python code that you wrote for uh, in either Gradio or Streamlit or or um, actually a pure uh, static web page, um, and you can share that on on Spaces. And what we'll do is we'll spin up a virtual machine and we'll host that for you. Uh, forever, uh, for free. So, uh, what's really great about that then is that you know, as these new models come out, or as uh, people do new and interesting things with machine learning, people build interfaces around them and then share them on Spaces, and then anybody can use them. 
And what's great about that is that uh, it opens up a whole new world of people that can use your machine learning models, right? So uh, in this case, we're seeing, well, you know, a few months ago, we released a, um, a demo for Anime GAN V2, uh, which is a GAN that makes you look like an anime character. And because this, uh, because Spaces and because Gradio made this so accessible, uh, we found that folks on Twitter really liked it because they like to take pictures of themselves, see themselves as sort of an anime character, make it their profile picture, tweet about it, et cetera. And so this is the first time that, you know, sort of machine learning models are able to go uh, really viral because uh, it, will, it accelerates the ability for machine learning models to go really viral, um, which is what's so great about being able to share things with the community. And so... You know, we're sort of at this turning point of machine learning, right? So before it was just these machine learning hacker type people, you know, uh, uh, that were able to accept to access, um, you know, state of the art machine learning. But now we're at a point where anybody uh, with a browser can access these models and use them and interface with them and, and poke and prod these models and try to identify uh, failure points and biases in these models, which which in turn helps us develop better uh, models, right? And so you know. Uh, because us as machine learning engineers, we might be biased or we might not understand how to poke and prod these models. Maybe your grandma's the one who's going to be able to figure out that it doesn't work when you're wearing glasses, you know, or something like that, right? Uh, uh, you never know, right? So what's great about this is that, you know, machine learning is as accessible as possible. So without further ado, what we're going to do next is we're actually going to do some live programming. So um, here we have a bit.ly link. Um, I will actually, whoop, I clicked on it. I will share this in the chat as well. So you don't have to copy it um, by hand. And what would be great is if you all are able to open that notebook and, and follow along with us as we go here, I think that'll really help um, uh, drive home some of these points. So uh, we'll kind of walk through it together. So uh, are you folks able to open that notebook? Let's open it up. Okay, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to jump into that notebook, um, and what I'll do is I'm going to scroll down all the way to this part um, where we're going to pip install Gradio. So pip installing. Uh, so oh yeah, real quick, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, we're in Google Colab right now, which uh, if you haven't used it before, it's basically like Google Docs but for code. So uh, here we're able to you know. Uh, all work together inside this notebook that I shared with you. You're able to run the same code that I'm running and um, uh, it's all hosted for you by Google. And so in order to run a certain cell, you can kind of come in here and you can either hit command enter or shift enter, shift return, whatever it is, uh, it depends what kind of computer you're on. Uh, I'm not Google, so we're gonna hit run anyways. Um, and what this will do is this will first install Gradio. So the library that we're gonna be using to build um, uh, demos. So we're just going to give that a second. Now, at this point, does anybody have any questions? And you can go ahead and feel free to drop them in the chat or, or whatever you'd like to do. Um, make sure I'm not breezing too fast here. All righty. Okay, so we'll skip ahead. Um, I'm going to zoom in a little bit just so you can see that a little better. Okay, so basically when you build a Gradio interface, um, uh, you need to first define the function that you're going to use to interface, um, uh, that you're going to build an interface around. So uh, what we're going to do here first is we're going to define a function called sepia, which is going to take in an image as an array, and it's going to apply a sepia filter on the image. And it's going to do that by, by calling a dot product on it uh, with this array here. And so you don't have to worry too much about uh, you know, the logic inside this function. Just know that uh, this function takes in an image and it's going to return an image. Okay. So we're going to run this cell to make sure that that function is defined. And then what we're going to do is we're going to import Gradio and we're going to uh, create a Gradio interface, this gr.interface. And now this interface class takes in three ingredients. The first ingredient is the function with which we'd like to interface with. The second ingredient is the input. So what kind of inputs are we gonna be coming into your function? In our case, it's gonna be an image. So this image here is uh, uh, the type of variable that's gonna be formatted and sent to this input parameter here when we're interfacing with the, the, the function that we created. And then we're gonna find the third ingredient, which is the output. So the outputs here are also an image. 
And so in this case, it's going to be expecting um, an image type to be coming back. So in this case, it's going to be a NumPy array, um, which is an image. And now what we can do is we can run this cell. And in this cell, uh, once the cell uh, completes uh, running, we're going to see an interface. So here we have an interface um, uh, with which we can upload an image. So I'm going to click here. And I'm going to use this, this meme I was planning on posting yesterday. Uh, this is Kanye with Who Loves Hogging Face. Uh, and we're going to uh, apply a sepia filter on that. And now we see a, a, a Kanye comes out at the end uh, with a filter. So that's great, right? So uh, what we've done is we've basically defined an interface around this function that we, we defined. And then uh, we're able to you know, kind of play around with it. OK, great. Any questions at this point? Okay, we'll move on to the, the, next, the next example here. Now, uh, this example uh, is going to generate a musical tone. So in this case, we're going to, to have a few different inputs. So we see that the function that we're defining, this generate tone function, is going to take in a few different parameters. The note, so um, you know, A, B, C, D uh, on the keyboard, um, with octave, uh, on the keyboard, you would like to uh, have the note be played at, and then the duration for which you'd like to hear that note played at. And what we're going to return here is actually an audio. Um, we're going to return audio uh, that is going to represent that note, that octave, and that duration. So in this case, we've got something a little bit different, right? We have three inputs instead of one. So let's see how we define the, the Gradio interface for that. We're going to first, right, there's three ingredients. So the first ingredient is that function, right, the generate tone function. The second ingredient is the, uh, and you don't have to write these, uh, I'm writing them explicitly just for uh, the sake of demonstration. Um, the second ingredient is the inputs. In this case, we see something a little bit different, and that's that um, there are three inputs. There's a list of inputs. So uh, this list of inputs corresponds with the parameters coming into this function that we're gonna be creating an interface around. So the first um, uh, item inside this list is going to be a drop down uh, type of input. So in this case, we're using not the shorthand string uh, sort of uh, 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 definitions like we did earlier, where we were just able to say image, right? Image here. Instead, what we're doing is we're calling to this gradio input, um, these gradio dot inputs uh, classes, and we're actually defining them directly. So in this case, we're defining a drop down with which uh, uh, there's going to be a bunch of the different musical notes that you can choose from. Uh, the, and that will correspond with note. The second input, the second uh, item here is going to be a slider. So from four to six for the octave. And then the third input is going to be a number, which is going to be in the form of a text box that'll just kind of cast it to an int. And that uh, corresponds with duration here because one, two, three, right? One, two, three. And when we run this, um, oh, I didn't write I, outputs, my bad. Outputs, that's the beauty of uh, live demoing. Um, and when we run this, we should get an interface that allows us to create a musical tone. So what I'm going to do now is I'll actually unplug my headphones and I'm going to run this and then we'll see. So I'll choose C uh, or I'll choose D and then I'll make my octave six. So I'll make it three seconds and then I'll hit submit. We should get an audio uh, interface uh, output back. So when I play this, right, you should be able to hear that output. And that's pretty, that's pretty cool, right? So, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at a bunch of different NumPy uh, uh, mumbo jumbo here, right? And instead of just uh, 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 seeing that and just getting a raise back, now we're able to actually really easily without having to import all sorts of other stuff, we're able to uh, uh, immediately hear the, um, the musical tone that we have here. And we're also able to, you know, create these dynamic inputs too, right? The, all sorts of multiple inputs. You can also do multiple outputs in some cases. Uh, we won't be covering that here, but that's also another possibility. So it's really awesome that you're able to, to sort of do this uh, as quickly as, as, as we just did. Alrighty, any questions about that? All right. Oh, you got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Ian, uh, um, duration time uh, gets in a text box.
or we. I, I just said I was muted. Yeah, yeah, um, it's all good. Yeah, it takes us text, and uh, if we we can type anything we want, so it's uh, cause a problem because you know right. one Jakarta uh, doesn't work. Right, great, great, uh, great point here. So here's here's how we can solve that. Right, I'll I'll do this uh, live. Uh, we, why don't we do this instead? Video.inputs.slider, and we'll do that from. Uh, that's going to be a number. We'll do it from one to five or something, right? And the step is going to be equal to one. Um, and we'll get rid of this last one, and uh, that should work just fine. Um, and so we create that. We make that a slider too. I think that's probably a little bit a better of a way to do this. So now we can create that, that right, and we can submit, and that should work just fine. But yeah, that's a great point. The text box leads to potential issues. Yes, but uh, that's better. I I agree. But um, when we the text box, uh, it says type number, but it still allows to uh, input uh, no, normal text. Yeah, I'm guessing the issue there is it probably just needs to have a better error message because it's going to try to cast it to an int, and then if it's if it's uh, screwing up the uh, if it's not an int, then it's probably just getting angry. It probably needs to. Uh, uh, it's a great point. Maybe we should uh, add like a little bit better of a warning there. Yeah. All right. Uh, another question here. Yeah, I had a question about um, how much control in the Gradio library do you have over the way in which uh, you know the form. The input form is uh, constructed. All right now, I notice that you're, you've just got these objects there, and I'm assuming that Gradio just positions things in some kind of grid or a window-like grid. Right. Just briefly, what, how much control do you have over, you know, the actual construction of that window, so to great. speak? Yeah, that's a great. That's a great. Um, uh, Point. So there's uh, actually a uh, a couple of options for there's not it's not too uh, you don't have too too much control you can do things like um, making things uh, uh, horizontal or vertical um, uh, also on a line it looks like uh, there's a few different options there there's things you can do with CSS you can provide your own custom CSS um, to to uh, update the style so for example like the style that we're seeing here is a little bit the style that we're seeing inside the Colab notebook is slightly different than the style that you might see on spaces because there's a different theme. Um, uh, so that's all done with CSS. But to answer your question, yeah, not you don't have, uh, it's not like uh, um, something where you're able to kind of dynamically say, I want to have a side thing here and then something here. You know, it's, it's not like a, a layout uh, builder. It's more just uh, the inputs and outputs. Now, in terms of the inputs and outputs themselves, you can come to gradio.app slash docs, which I'll drop inside the chat. And inside there, you can see all the different types of inputs and outputs that you can have. And also you can read a little bit more about the um, different layout um, uh, options that you might have. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That, that's not a bad thing. I'm an old Windows programmer, so <laughs> if you can have too many options and you can't get anything done. You know, you right. want to get something up. So I'm... Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's I think it looks like you you found a pretty nice balance here between you know being able to demo something and the right level of functionality to do so. Right. Yeah, and and uh when I first found uh Gradio, I've been a longtime user of Streamlit and I remember Streamlit being uh you know, it has all sorts of features and that's great. Um uh and it's it's great for certain use cases, but when you're just trying to make a prediction with a machine learning model, uh you only have really a couple of things that you're really trying to do. You're trying to define some inputs, you're trying to have a function, you're trying to have some outputs. And I think that's where Gradio really shines. Yeah. Um okay, anybody else before we move on? All righty. Okay. So we'll I'm gonna show you something else that's um uh, pretty sweet. So, you know, Lewis talked about uh, the Hog and Face Hub earlier, how there's a bunch of models up there. So something that you can actually do uh, with, with, uh, uh, with Gradio is you can actually call the gradio.interface.low. So we were using interface uh, earlier and, and defining it, right? Using the init, the init uh, method of the class. But instead, if we use the, the uh, class method uh, load, is interface.load, we can load hug and face models directly from the hub. So how you do that is, you know, each model on the hub has sort of an identifier, which would look like this, this Facebook fast speech to, and uh, we, we um, uh, prepend on this hug and face slash in front of it to tell it's coming from hug and face. And you're able to immediately, if you run this, load this model from the hub. 
And so what this is actually doing is it's going to use the inference API that, that Lewis uh, kind of demoed to earlier, where he was writing some things inside the, the widget there and, and um, uh, making predictions. This is actually going to run right through that, but we're going to have a nice little interface for it. So um, yeah, uh, and if this, this will load here, there we go. Excellent. So this one is uh, a text-to-speech model. So um, hey there, I am teaching a class about machine learning. I wonder how it handles exclamation marks. Does it just start yelling? Who knows? Um, OK, so uh, okay, this one spat something out. I'm going to unplug my headphones again. Hey there, I am teaching a class about machine learning. OK, great. Great. Um, awesome. So, if, you know, if you're a, a secretly a member of Anonymous and you're trying to uh, create a new video, uh, <laughs> maybe you could use this text to speech here. Uh, all right. So let's move on to another example. Uh, uh, we're going to take a look now at uh, Luther AI GPTJ 6B. So this um, this model is a text generation model. So what it does is it takes in some text and it tries to uh, auto complete it. Um, and so this is again the, the identifier, this Luther AI GPT J6B. It's actually a 6 billion parameter uh, model, which is pretty huge uh, for being out in the open. Um, and what we're also going to do is I'm going to show you that you can provide examples, which will allow you to sort of prompt users to uh, as to what they what sorts of things they can enter um, into your into your interface. And what what's really helpful about this is that you know. Uh, especially for like image-based apps when you're building image-based apps. And this really comes into play in spaces, um, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, folks might come in here. And if I asked one of you right now, like, what should I write here? You know, <laughs> you're going to feel like you're on the spot, right? And you're not going to maybe know exactly what you should put in here. But when you see an example down here that you can just click and you can try out, uh, you're immediately, like, you can immediately start playing with it. And then you can maybe then, that maybe that'll spark creativity for you and you'll know what, what, you, should, what, you, should, what you should put. So, you know, the moon's, moon's orbit around Earth has changed many times, you know. Uh, there once was a pineapple. Okay. Um, uh, not sure I like that trend, that one so much. Uh, well, I'm going to go back to this one. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, so you, you can write anything here. So um, I can say, hey, my name is Nate, and today I am, well, let's see. Let's see if we can get something good. Discussing the game, The Witcher. Okay, cool. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so that is uh, that is how you'd use the, the interface.load um, uh, function. Uh, it looks like I got a message in the, the chat here. The overrides is with the most recent. Correct. Yeah, so I think you're talking about uh, um, let me just clarify. So somebody in the chat said, I noticed that it's overriding the previous public URLs with the most recent model or app. And that was Jason. Now, Jason, can you clarify for me in the in the um, chat if you're talking about this link right here? Yeah. Yeah. So like, for example, the one with um, the previous, like the sepia filter one, um, when I went to reload that on my phone, it, it now it's playing the, the Facebook speech one. Right. Right. So uh, yes, I can explain this. So um, these public links, these public links are temporary public links. So it's where you can host your app temporarily. And that happens when you use share equals true. In Colab, it actually happens by default, whether you write share equals true or share equals false, because uh, it has to do with actually how the networking works. There's no way to, you have to like, if we're creating a tunnel basically to the compute. Um, and so in this case, uh, this is a tunnel straight to this compute. So whatever app is the most recent one that's been run is the one that you're going to be able to find at this app. But what's nice about this is that I can share this link in the chat right now for everybody. And you'll be able to open that up and actually use the same one that I'm looking at. And this is just, again, a tunnel, a temporary tunnel to this compute, um, if that makes sense. But yeah, uh, that was a great great thing to bring up. Thank you for bringing that up because I wanted to talk about that. Um, Thanks, Nate. Mm -hmm. And now, because that's temporary, you know, temp being something, uh, you know, being able to access your app temporarily is, is nice because, you know, while you're developing, maybe you're working with a collaborator or something, you're like, hey, check this out real quick, you know. Um, but if you're ready to actually, you know, if you're done and you're ready to um, share your, your interface with the world, um, you need a more uh, permanent solution. And so, as we talked about earlier, 
um, uh, that's that's where we um, would use spaces. So spaces here uh, is uh, on our site. So if we go to hf hf .space, um, or hf .co spaces, you'll find hugging face spaces. So these are all the different uh, spaces that have been built. Some of these, you know, even as most recently as four minutes ago, people are building and sharing these spaces. Uh, and if you come in here, uh, you can hit create a new space and you can create a space uh, for yourself. It looks like we're out of time, so I won't be able to create a space here today. But what I highly suggest you do is you come into um, uh, come come in here, create an account, and and create a space. And so how you do that is just come in here, you hit create radio, you'd name it, and then you'd you'd add an app.py file which contains your 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 code. So we could even like you know just copy something straight out of this collab notebook, and you'd be able to run these spaces uh, for free and host them for free um, permanently. Uh, which allows you to share them with the world. And maybe your machine learning model can go viral. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, that's... Uh...